Hey, Prime members, you can listen to Killer Psyche ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the app today. A listener note. This episode contains adult content and is not suitable for everyone. Please be advised. If you ask most people, the idea of being royalty, well very appealing. Although not so much now with the news coverage and all the scandals. But let's say you could be Zeus or Hera, the king and queen of the Greek gods. Back in a time when they ruled all of Earth. Yes, I know this is just make-believe, but imagine having an infinite amount of power and wealth. You would think you would be happy, content, Well, Hera was not. Not that I can completely fault her for this. She was married to Zeus, who might as well have been the king of philandering. Zeus flaunted his numerous affairs, and Hera was powerless to stop him. She was not, however, prevented from punishing the objects of her husband's affections. Although Hera knew that some of Zeus's so-called indiscretions were actually unwilling victims that Zeus had tricked and raped, Hera showed no mercy to the victims or even the children of the victims. Her vengeance was creative. She transformed a human paramour into a cow and a nymph into a bear that she had another god shoot. Hera would also dole out curses that drove some of her victims insane. For example, after finding out that one of Zeus's lovers, Leto, was pregnant, she kidnapped the goddess of childbirth, which prevented Leto from having an easy pregnancy and delivery. Hera also prevented Leto from being able to give birth on dry land or solid ground, keeping her in labor and pain for a long time until Zeus stepped in to help. The subject of our episode today, Stephanie Lazarus, shared Hera's jealousy and revenge instincts, at least when it involved romance. Except Stephanie was not the wife or girlfriend of the man who inspired it. And her way of retaliating was not at all creative. It was just a simple, horrific act of murder. We get support from Audible. Audible has a growing selection of wellness titles in all categories, including physical, mental, social, motivational, and financial wellness. From their Audible Sleep Collection, I am currently enjoying different soundscapes and playing them in the background as I unwind in the evening. And as an Audible member, you can choose one title a month to keep from their entire catalog, including the latest bestsellers and new releases. New members can try Audible free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash psyche or text psyche to 500-500. That's audible.com slash psyche or text psyche to 500-500. Killer Psyche is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Whether you love true crime or comedy, celebrity interviews or news, you call the shots on what's in your podcast queue. And guess what? Now you can call them on your auto insurance too with the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. It works just the way it sounds. You tell Progressive how much you want to pay for car insurance, and they'll show you coverage options that fit your budget. Get your quote today at Progressive.com to join the over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. From Wondery and Treefort Media, I'm Candace DeLong, and this is the third season of Killer Psyche. (laughs) 
I was a psychiatric nurse and then an FBI criminal profiler. In the five decades I've spent studying people's minds, I've interviewed countless murderers, including many serial killers. Why did they do it? To get a satisfying answer, we have to dive deep into their psyche to figure out what made them do what they did. This episode is Stephanie Lazarus. Sherry Rasmussen was convinced that she was being watched. A few weeks before her wedding in November of 1985, the 29-year-old nursing director called her parents and told them that her fiancé, John Rutten, had a problematic relationship with his ex-girlfriend, Stephanie Lazarus, whom she only referred to as a, quote, lady cop. It would be an understatement to say that Stephanie had not moved on from the relationship. She had a tendency of showing up unannounced to the couple's condo in Van Nuys, California. Sometimes she claimed she stopped by just to say hello, and other times she would ask John for odd favors, like waxing her pair of skis. Stephanie did not take the news of their engagement well. She told John that Sherry could never love him as much as she did. When John refused to be swayed, she begged him to have sex with her one more time for closure. So John agreed, and for the sake of closure, right, he had sex with Stephanie one last time. Do I really need to comment on how ridiculous that is? Of course, this did not inspire any type of closure for Stephanie. In fact, it escalated her desperation. The female officer barged into Sherry's place of work and yelled that John still had feelings for her. Before Stephanie left, she threatened Sherry, saying, quote, if I cannot have John, nobody can. Despite Sherry's fears, her fiance assured her that she had nothing to worry about. As the date of their nuptials grew closer, John began to cut off all contact with his former fling. And on November 23rd, the couple wed. But even with John's ex seemingly out of their lives, Sherry could not shake the gut feeling that something was wrong. When Sherry would take a trip to the grocery store, Stephanie would be there. Sometimes when Sherry would peek out of her window, she could see an LAPD cop car parked on the street. Sherry desperately wanted to believe that these were just coincidences, but unfortunately, they were not. On the morning of February 24, 1986, Sherry called in sick to work. Before leaving for the day, John kissed her goodbye and told her that he would be calling to check on her. After a few hours, John tried to call Sherry, but she didn't pick up, and every other attempt to reach her failed. When his workday was over, he rushed home, eager to see that his wife was okay. But when John pulled up to their condo, he knew something was wrong. Their garage door was open, and Sherry's BMW was missing. He opened the front door and saw that drawers were open and rummaged through. Electronics were unplugged and scattered throughout the living room. Glass was shattered on the floor. But the mess was not what drew John's attention. Sherry lay motionless in the middle of the room, covered in bruises and blood. His wife of only three months was dead. When LAPD homicide detectives got to the scene, they began to piece together what happened that morning. They noted that Sherry was still in her pajamas. The officers took that as a sign that she had not been expecting any visitors. There were no signs of forced entry, indicating that their front door may have been unlocked. Sherry had blunt force trauma to her head, which they believe accounted for the shattered vase on the floor next to her body. She had three gunshot wounds in her chest and a 
bite mark on her left arm, which was swabbed by a forensic specialist. It took only a few hours for detectives to conclude Sherry's death was a burglary gone wrong. Burglaries were common in Los Angeles at the time, and police believed that Sherry was just another victim in their growing list of similar cases. But the only problem with that theory was that the only items stolen from the condo were Sherry's car and her and John's marriage license. When John called Sherry's parents to tell them about the murder, they immediately reached out to the detectives working the case and told them to look into John's ex-girlfriend, the lady cop Sherry had told them about a few months prior. Detectives took a note of it and put it in the case file. The day after the murder, a detective sat down with John to discuss the investigation. John brought up concerns about a woman named Stephanie Lazarus, an ex-girlfriend who just so happened to be an LAPD officer. But according to an article by Vanity Fair, all records of that conversation were missing from the case file. In fact, the only mention of Stephanie was tucked away in a single note that read, quote, John Rutten called, verified Stephanie Lazarus, police officer, was former girlfriend. But the LAPD was confident that their burglary theory was correct and that Stephanie was not involved. Because of the brutality of the scene, they were convinced that Sherry was burglarized and killed by two unknown males. In April, two months after Sherry's murder, the LAPD got a call about an attempted burglary just a few blocks from Sherry's condo. The two unidentified males suspected in Sherry's murder were considered suspects in this case as well. This solidified the detective's burglary gone wrong theory. But after releasing sketches to the public and offering a reward, no leads were developed. Sherry's murder remained unsolved, and her case file sat on shelves collecting dust for 18 years. In December 2004, a forensic scientist at the LAPD noticed Sherry's untouched file sitting on her colleague's desk. It was one of many cases that the new Cold Case Homicide Unit was taking a closer look at. They were using the FBI's Revolutionary Combined DNA Index System, also known as CODIS, to see if any DNA evidence would lead them to arrest in unsolved cases. We've mentioned CODIS in previous Killer Psyche episodes. It is a program that allows law enforcement to run evidence against a national database of known and unknown offenders' DNA. But there was one thing missing from the evidence, a swab taken from the bite mark on Sherry's arm. Months later, when the forensic scientist finally received it from the coroner's office, she began her analysis. CODIS brought up no matches, but DNA analysis did provide a gender marker, XX. And this told her two things. One, the person who bit Sherry was a female. And two, the original theory of two male burglars was, well, flawed. The forensic scientist sent her report to the cold case unit, but no action was taken. And once again, Sherry's file went cold. In 2009, 23 years after Sherry's murder, homicide detectives in Van Nuys desperately wanted to solve a cold case. After screening their files, they landed on Sherry's and got to work. They immediately took notice of the DNA analysis done a few years before. They looked for any and all female names brought up in the initial investigation. Much to their surprise, one of them was Stephanie Lazarus, who at this point was a detective in the LAPD's prestigious art theft unit. The detectives were skeptical, but after they ruled out all the other women mentioned in the file, their focus shifted 
to Stephanie. Slowly, the pieces of the two-decade-long puzzle started to come together. In the original investigation, it was determined that Sherry was shot with a 38 caliber revolver, but the murder weapon was never found. In 2009, detectives discovered that, coincidentally, just 13 days after Sherry's murder, Stephanie reported her backup firearm, a 38 caliber Smith & Wesson, stolen. But without a way to link Stephanie's gun to the murder, they decided to link her through something infallible, DNA. On May 27th, plainclothes detectives followed Stephanie around a Costco while she ran errands with her daughter. After grabbing a quick drink and bite to eat, Stephanie threw her cup in the trash. Detectives promptly collected the cup and sent it to the lab for testing. Two days later, the crime lab had their results. And surprise, surprise, the DNA from the bite mark on Sherry's arm matched that of Stephanie Lazarus. On June 5th, the detectives staged an interview at the station where Stephanie worked. They approached her and asked for her help with interviewing a suspect in an art theft case. But when she stepped into the interrogation room, there was no alleged art thief in sight. And when they began asking questions about John Rutten and Sherry Rasmussen, it was clear that she was the one being interrogated. Stephanie dodged the detective's questions. She gave vague answers like, I'm not sure, I don't remember, and I don't know what to tell you, and blamed her evasiveness on a foggy memory. But the detectives did not buy it. When she was asked for a DNA sample, Stephanie said, quote, I'm really shocked that somebody would be saying that I did this. I mean, we had a fight, and so I went and killed her? I mean, come on. Stephanie continued her righteous indignation rant as she rose and exited the room, but she did not get far. Seconds after she left, Stephanie Lazarus was arrested and charged with murder. Protect the ones you love in the best ways you can with Simply Safe Home Security. It is an advanced system that protects every inch of your home. And it is backed by 24 7 professional monitoring for fast emergency response for less than a dollar a day. Simply Safe offers everything you need for entire home protection HD cameras for indoors and outdoors, advanced motion sensors and entry sensors, and a collection of hazard sensors that detect fires, flooding, and more. I have Simply Safe and I love it. It allows me to feel comfortable and protected in my own home. And when I'm away from home, I sense the same thing. It's there watching out for me. Order now to get 20% off any new Simply Safe system with fast protect monitoring. Don't wait. Visit simplysafe.com/psyche. That's simplysafe.com/psyche. There's no safe like Simply Safe. Whether you're trying to save money, eat better or stress less, HelloFresh is here to help you do all three. Say hello to your most delicious year yet with fresh ingredients and chef-crafted recipes at a price you'll like, delivered right to your door. With over 45 recipes to choose from, you'll never have to wonder what you're making for dinner. Each HelloFresh box is packed with farm-fresh ingredients, and everything arrives pre-proportioned right to your doorstep for less hassle and less wasted food. One of my favorites is Parmesan crusted trout. Mmm, yummy. Go to HelloFresh.com slash PsycheFree and use the code PsycheFree for free breakfast for life. One breakfast item per box while subscription is active. That's free breakfast for life at HelloFresh.com slash PsycheFree with code PsycheFree. Psyche 
Stephanie Lazarus was born in Englewood, California in 1960. When she was still in elementary school, her family moved to the city of Simi Valley. According to her brother, the Lazarus family had a typical middle-class upbringing. In an interview with LA Magazine, he said he and his siblings were, quote, never deprived of anything, ever. When Stephanie was 18, she was accepted into UCLA. Her freshman year kicked off in 1978, and she quickly immersed herself in campus life. Fellow students loved her bubbly personality and gravitated to her. So did a mechanical engineering student named John Rutten. Stephanie and John started dating. At least, that's what Stephanie thought. John described the relationship as, quote, necking and fooling around, while Stephanie claimed they were in love. In 1982, after four years of an on-again, off-again sexual relationship, Stephanie and John called it quits, and they both graduated from UCLA that year. John went into engineering, and Stephanie went straight to the Los Angeles Police Academy. She became an officer just one year later. Stephanie and John stayed in contact as friends, but John failed to mention one small detail to Stephanie, that he had fallen in love with a nursing director named Sherry Rasmussen. In fact, Stephanie was unaware of his new relationship until September 1984, when she decided to throw him a surprise birthday party. At the party, John pulled Stephanie aside and thanked her for the gesture. It was then that John broke the news. He was now in a serious, committed relationship. Stephanie was distraught. Oh, and did I mention she was also furious? For the next several months, Stephanie and John had little to no contact until she found out that he was engaged. Soon after she received the news of his engagement in May of 1985, Stephanie begged John to visit her at her apartment to talk things through. As we spoke about in Act One, Stephanie convinced John to have sex with her one last time for closure. But if Stephanie hoped that would change things, he still refused to call off his engagement to Sherry. However, he promised to keep in contact with Stephanie. Wow, what a nice guy. This only fueled Stephanie's obsession. She thought that if he was willing to have sex with her, it must mean he still had feelings for her. Now she was determined to get him back by any means. In Stephanie's mind, for her to be happy and whole again after being jilted by John, Sherry had to go. After John ended their four-year college life affair in favor of another woman, Stephanie became what is called an obsessional estranged lover. These are people who simply cannot let go of a romantic relationship, and they can be dangerous, obviously. According to Dr. Robbie Ludwig, quote, their entire self-identity is dependent on the other person's love and need for them to be in their life. Without someone in love with them, they feel empty. Their self-worth is non-existent. They only feel whole when merged with someone that loves them. In August of 1985, Stephanie sent a letter to John's mother. She wrote, quote, I'm truly in love with John, and the past year has really torn me up. I wish it didn't end the way it did, and I don't think I'll ever understand his decision. A few weeks after she sent the letter, Stephanie started showing up to John and Sherry's condo, unannounced. These visits, the same one Sherry told her parents about, became a nuisance to the couple. But even after Sherry brought up her concerns to John, he never told Stephanie to stay away. 
After their wedding in November, Stephanie still kept a watchful eye on the couple. She roamed around their neighborhood in her police cruiser often. From afar, she knew exactly how Sherry's days played out. She knew where and when Sherry worked and even knew where she bought her groceries. We know that Stephanie became Sherry's stalker. According to Dr. Ludwig, Stephanie's type of stalker has only one motivation, reconciliation. The jilted one thinks they cannot exist without their partner. Getting the object of their obsession back becomes their singular focus. Sound like anyone we've been talking about? Is this person, the obsessional, estranged lover, mentally ill? Absolutely not. A psychopath? Yes. A psychotic? No. As an example, let's look at the man who stalked Madonna for years, Robert Hoskins. He thought the pop icon was his wife. Truly, he believed that. Was his problem the same as Stephanie's? No, not even in the same ballpark. Hoskins was what is known as an erotically obsessed stalker. That is a stalker previously unknown to the victim. This type of stalker imagines they have a connection to the stranger they are stalking. It is their delusion. They believe it with every red blood cell in their body. And nothing, not even the cold, hard facts, can convince them otherwise. Just to give you an example as to how powerful an obsession like this can be by someone who is mentally ill, when Hoskins was spotted via security cameras on Madonna's property, her bodyguard confronted him. Hoskins yelled back words to the effect, who are you? I'm her husband. Later in custody, he said he was there to either marry her or kill her. Yet earlier that day, when he was scoping out where she lived, Madonna jogged right past him and he didn't even recognize her. So you see the problem with this man's mind? He didn't even recognize the woman he's been obsessing about. Back at the ranch, the bodyguard got into hand-to-hand -hand combat with Hoskins before being forced to shoot him twice. Hoskins was sentenced to 10 years in prison, but just to put a fine point on how delusional he was, or perhaps I should say is, even while there and forced to take antipsychotic medication, his cell was plastered with pictures of the object of his obsession, Madonna. In an interview with a local news channel, he said on camera, quote, when I get out, I'm going to kill her. He threatened to slit the throat of the woman he claimed to love. Once again, you see the problem with this type of stalker? Nothing they do makes sense to us, but to them, it makes perfect sense. But Hoskins was psychotic, and Stephanie was not. The only similarities is that their motivations were indistinguishable, possessing their love interests for themselves at the expense of all others, no matter what. And on February 24, 1986, when Sherry broke her usual routine, Stephanie was there as usual, waiting. As soon as John pulled out of their garage, Stephanie realized Sherry would not be going to work that day, and she made her move. In Stephanie's mind, if Sherry was no longer around, if she didn't exist at all, certainly John would come back to her. She failed to consider that apparently John never really loved her that much at all. She thought killing Sherry would make her dream life with John a reality. But not long after losing his wife, John quit his job and moved out of L.A. Even though her plan to win John back failed, her other plan succeeded. 
her plan of getting away with murder. In the 23 years before her arrest, Stephanie got married, adopted a daughter, and became a highly regarded detective. She got to live a completely normal life, all while Sherry Rasmussen's family grieved. And let us not forget, at the time of Sherry's brutal murder, Stephanie was a cop, a revered member of society bestowed with the honor of protecting others. And in order to keep their job, they are expected to live an exemplary life beyond reproach. Let me be the first to say here, what the F happened? Well, aside from being an obsessional, estranged lover stalker, Stephanie was on a self-imposed mission, a mission to eliminate the competition. Was she crazy like Robert Hoskins? No, not at all. But she was, as Dr. Ludwig says, quote, more likely to be psychopathic, a personality disorder, not a mental illness. And if this episode is your first time listening to Killer Psyche, psychopathy is not a mental illness at all. It is what I call a chink in the DNA armor. A psychopath knows right from wrong, but has no trouble at all doing wrong if it serves their purpose. And they feel no guilt or shame over whatever it is they do, no matter whom it hurts or whom they bite. As I've said before, serial killers are extremely rare. Murderous, jealous lovers? Not so much. In America alone, about 30% of the approximately 21,000 murders committed annually are motivated by jealousy in one way or another. Jealousy takes many forms. Just to name a few, it can be irrational or pathological, or it can be sibling, professional, or the most common type of jealousy, romantic. Romantic jealousy is going on in the mind and heart of someone who kills another person over the real or perceived threat to a romantic relationship. In the category of romantic jealousy, a person in love with another may be so jealous of a possible or real love interest of their partner, a love rival, that they kill them. And that's what happened here. But even though serial killers are an infinitesimal percent of our total population of 330 million people, I find them infinitely less interesting than jealousy killers, of which there are hundreds a year. Why? Because the vast majority of serial killers have similar backgrounds. And if you're a devoted Killer Psyche fan, then you know what those are. Horrible childhoods, sexual, emotional, and or physical abuse as little kids, brain damage, an incestuous parent, and neglect, just to name the primary factors. But serial killers are not motivated by jealousy. The ones that make the headlines and the final cut to be a killer psyche pick of the week, like Ted Bundy, usually kill because they want to live out a very long-standing, violent, sometimes sexual fantasy that they've been nurturing since they were in early adolescence. Though serial killers might not have any trouble at all killing someone because they are jealous of them, that's not their usual bill of fare. Other serial killers are motivated out of personal or financial gain, such as black widows, like the stars of our recent episode on the mother-son serial killer team, Sante and Kenny Kimes. Still others, usually con artists, kill to avoid detection of their crimes. And the rarest type, the mission-oriented serial killer, is almost always psychotic. He or she is hearing voices. They are delusional. And they kill because they are compelled to do so because of their mental illness, such as 
Richard Chase, the Sacramento vampire killer that we featured in season one. Don't get me wrong, all of these cases are very interesting, even fascinating on most occasions, but rarely does my interest rise to the level that it does when a well-educated, respected, licensed professional, such as a doctor or lawyer or a law enforcement professional, plan execute and cover up the murder of someone of whom they are jealous. So why do I think that? Well, first of all, the vast, vast, vast majority of serial killers had a childhood few Hollywood screenwriters could even imagine. But well-educated professionals rarely come from that type of breeding ground. And that's what we're talking about today. That's why I find the case of Stephanie Lazarus so compelling. We like to think that normal people, especially the ones that seemingly had all the breaks in life to get them where they landed, can reason out their problems and not make a mess out of their life or especially anyone else's. And yet, it happened. Why? It's actually quite easily explained. What happened between Stephanie and Sherry is a story as old as time and has probably resulted in more murders and wasted lives than could ever be counted. The jealousy monster reared its very ugly head, won the battle, and an innocent person died. Sherry was definitely innocent, but is Stephanie Lazarus a monster? There is nothing nothing at all in Stephanie's childhood that would or could have predicted the violence she exhibited later in life, nor the psychopathy. Of course, when I say that, I'm implying that Stephanie struggled with her feelings of jealousy, but there is no evidence of that at all. In fact, I think there's plenty of reason to believe she never lost a wink of sleep over taking Sherry's very young and promising life. Point in fact, only three years after she murdered Sherry, she and Sherry's husband, John, went away on a Hawaiian vacation. It doesn't sound like she was haunted by a very guilty conscience to me. Achieving a gorgeous grin from home isn't a total mystery with Bite Clear Aligners. Just don't be surprised if all of your sleuthing friends start asking, what's your secret? Begin by ordering your at-home impression kit today for only $14.95. Bite Clear Aligners are doctor-directed and delivered to your door. Treatment costs thousands less than braces. Plus, they offer flexible financing, accept eligible insurance, and you can pay with your HSA FSA. Get 80% off your impression kit when you use code WONDERY at Byte.com. That's B-Y-T-E dot com. Start your confidence journey today with Byte. Three days after her arrest, Stephanie pled not guilty to charges of first-degree murder. Her colleagues at the LAPD were shocked. For more than two decades, she had worked her way up the ranks and had become a respected detective. It was difficult for them to fathom that she was a murderer. The case also shocked the public. Jealousy, love, and murder all at the hands of a killer cop? It was a media storm waiting to happen. Stephanie's bail was set at $10 million, and she was sent to an all-female jail facility to await trial. For almost three years, her lawyer tried every tactic he could to get her case dismissed. First, he claimed that the 23-year-old evidence used to make an arrest had been degraded. When that failed, the lawyer switched his focus and tried to get evidence from a search warrant after her arrest thrown out. His argument was that there was no way anything found in her home in 2009 would be relevant to the murder in 1986. What he did not know was that police found Stephanie's old diary in their search. 
The judge deemed the entries from the 1980s containing details of her feelings for John permissible. The final attempt was challenging the DNA evidence. Because the crime lab used a new DNA testing system at the time, the lawyer asserted that the results should be analyzed again to prove their validity. Of course, that challenge could blow up in your face because the results could come back doing exactly that, proving the validity. But despite his efforts, all of his motions were dismissed. Stephanie's trial began in February 2012, 26 years after Sherry's murder. At trial, the defense reminded the jury about the original theory of the burglary gone wrong. Stephanie's lawyer focused on the two burglary suspects from 1986. The judge ruled that defense was not admissible since those suspects were never identified. The prosecution's argument that Stephanie killed Sherry in a fit of jealousy and rage was based on circumstantial evidence. They called in John to testify about Stephanie's unhealthy obsession with him and Video from Stephanie's interrogation was also shown to the jury. But it was the DNA collected from the bite mark that became the prosecution's key piece of evidence, and the results from the lab work were indisputable. And by the way, the results of DNA are not circumstantial. That is called hard evidence. In March 2012, Stephanie was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to 27 years in prison. It is now 12 years later, and Stephanie Lazarus is serving her sentence at the California Institution for Women in Corona. However, on November 16, 2023, the parole board recommended she receive parole after serving not even half her sentence for taking the life of a young woman. If their decision is finalized, and I certainly hope it is not, Stephanie Lazarus could be released as early as July of 2024. Hey, Prime members, you can listen to Killer Psyche ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today, or you can listen ad-free with Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts. Before you go, tell us about yourself by completing a short survey at wondery.com survey. From Wondery and Tree Fort Media, this is Killer Psyche. I'm your host, Candace DeLong. This episode was written and produced by Lisa Ammerman and Julie Burke. Anne Liu is our producer, and Jada Williams is our associate producer. Story research and additional writings by Anne Liu, Will Christensen, and Jada Williams. Mix and sound design by Matt Dyson and Aaron Bauman. Head of audio, Tom Monahan, with audio assistance from Misuzu Enaga. For Wondery, Stephanie Wachneen and Claire Chambers are producers, and Callum Plews is senior managing producer. The executive in charge of production for Treefort is Oscar Guido, and the co-executive producer is Julie Burke. Lastly, our executive producers are Kelly Garner and Lisa Ammerman for Treefort, and Marshall Louie, Morgan Jones, and Aaron O'Flaherty for Wondery. And last but not least, myself, Candace DeLong. The series is produced by Wondery and Treefort Media. Wondery's new podcast, Blame It on the Fame, dives into one of pop music's biggest controversies. Millie Vanilli set the world on fire, but when their adoring fans learned about the infamous lip syncing, their downfall was swift and brutal. With exclusive interviews from frontman Fab Morvan and his producers Frank Varian and Ingrid Segui, this podcast takes a fresh look at the exploitation of two young Black artists. Follow Blame It on the Fame wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen to Blame It on the Fame early and ad-free by joining Wondery Plus.